Hi, welcome everyone. We will just give it a moment and let everybody get into the webinar. Welcome everyone. We're just giving it a moment to let everybody get into the session. Okay, Pauline, would you like to kick off? I would love that. Thank you, Shannon. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And thank you for joining us again today, or perhaps for the first time in this series. My name is Pauline Vermaer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New York. And with my colleague Shannon Gannam, Global Educator, Education Director, we are your host for the Beyond Magnum series. Beyond Magnum is an in-depth talks program created to explore some of the challenges facing our industry today. Through this series of free talks and chapters addressing archives, representation, and the future of photography, speakers will share thoughts and engage in debate across a range of issues. Each section will be led by respected figures from the world of photography, and speakers will range from practitioners to academics to subject of photographs. Recordings from chapter one and two can be found on the Beyond Magnum page and on the Magnum Photos YouTube channel. And you can hear more from our president, Olivia Arthur, about the aims of the program in the first session. Some housekeeping before we kick off. Today's event is being hosted via Zoom webinar and you will be able to participate via the Q&A box. Please put in any comments, questions for our speakers or tech questions. We recognize that the series of events will likely raise more questions than answer them, and that this is the beginning of a conversation. So we thank you all for your contributions to that dialogue. You will be seeing more from us following the program as to how we will take the dialogue forward um, for us as an agency and as part of a wider industry. With that, I'll hand over um, to chapter co-chair Noel flores uh, who with Anthony Louvera has curated this chapter's conversations. Thanks, thank you again, Noel and Anthony. And I would invite Noel, uh, Flores Tear, Kristen Leben, Shahid Ulalam, and Mark Silly to join us on screen. Thank you all so much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Juneteenth for those of us that are here in the United States. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Noel Flores Tayard, and I was invited <clears throat> to host this conversation focusing on institutions as change makers. Um, I want to thank Magnum for inviting me and also to my wonderful co-chair, Anthony Libera, who's been just a joy to work with. So today we have three incredible individuals who are actually old friends. Um, and the, our goal today is just to kind of get the conversation started and get a sense of, you know, why is it important to build institutions? Why is it important to build capacity? So I would like to introduce, and I, if you uh, humor me, these bios are very important and uh, these are very distinguished guests, so I'm going to go ahead and read them. So Dr. Shahidul Alam, Time Magazine Person of the Year 2018, is a photographer, writer, and curator who has championed human rights throughout his career. Um, a recipient of the, I may mispronounce this, Shilpakala Award, the highest national award given to uh, Bangladeshi artists, Alam obtained a PhD in chemistry before switching to photography. Returning to Dhaka in 1984, he produced his seminal work documenting the democratic struggle to remove General Ershad. A former president of the Bangladesh Photographic Society, Alam's work has been exhibited in leading galleries like MoMA, Centre de Georges Pompidou, and Tate Museum. A speaker at Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, Oxford, and Cambridge universities, Alam is a visiting professor of uh, Sunderland University and RMIT, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Photographic Society. He has chaired International Jury of the World Press Photo. Um, he has uh, published many books. His book, The Tide Will Turn, was on the New York Times list of best books of 2020. He is the founder of the Drick Picture Library, the Pastala Media Institute, and the Majority World Agency and the Toby Mella Festival of Photography. I'm really excited to talk to him about what he's built. 
Um, he is also the new media pioneer and introduced email to Bangladesh in the early 90s. Fascinating. Considered a prisoner of conscience, he was arrested in 2018 for criticizing his government and spent 107 days in jail, but was released on bail following a massive international campaign for his release. In 2020, Alam won the International Press Freedom Award conferred by the Committee to Protect Journalists. He is currently setting up the Center for Investigative Journalism in Bangladesh. Uh, wonderful to have you with us here, Shahidul. Kristen Lubin is a curator, writer, and editor whose work explores the intersection of photography, art, and politics. Prior to joining the Magnum Foundation as its first executive director in 2016, she was curator at the International Center of Photography in New York. She has curated numerous exhibitions, including triennials of contemporary photography and video, monographic surveys of socially engaged artists, and installations drawn from her research in historical archives, including the ICP's collection of the work of Robert Kappa and is it Herada? Herda, I should know this. Taro, thank you. <laughs> she is the author of several publications, including uh, Magnum Contact Sheets and Susan Mizellus in History. Um, I had the great, great pleasure of working with Kristen for five years at the Magnum Foundation where I served as program officer. Um, so I'm really excited to be in conversation with her today. And then Dr. Mark Seeley, whose work I've followed for 20 years. Um, it's just really a pleasure to have you here with us. We had a chance to meet each other in Houston at PhotoFest where he curated the exhibition there, uh, 2019, I believe. So uh, Dr. Mark Seeley, Executive Director of Autograph ABP, uh, 1991 and Principal Research Fellow, Decolonizing Photography at University of Arts London. Um, Mark is interested in the relationship between photography and social change, identity politics, race, and human rights. He has written for many of the world's leading photographic journals, produced numerous art artist publications, curated exhibitions, and commissioned photographers and filmmakers worldwide. So um, truly a pleasure to have you all in conversation in the pre kind of green room. It was great to listen to kind of Mark and Shahidul catch up after many years and Kristen too. So I'd love for us to keep this kind of conversation open. Um, and I'd love to hand it over now to Kristen Levin. So what we'll do is just format wise, have each of the panelists share a little bit about their work in terms of institution building. And then we'll just segue straight to the conversation and discussion and I'll be facilitating that. So um, Kristen, if you wanna go ahead and take us away. Sure, thank you so much, Noel. As you said, it's a pleasure to be back in conversation and extend the conversations we always had in the office, um, as well as to be in conversation with um, Mark and Shaidul, longtime partners and friends and, and collaborators. And I'm so glad also that Magnum is hosting this event and bringing so many interesting people together to really talk about the issues and ideas that are informing all of our work right now. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the work that we do at the Magnum Foundation. Um, but first, I sort of had two ideas that I wanted to put out based on the title of the presentation, which is Institutions as Changemakers. And I was thinking about that word institution. And I think, um, you know, I don't know how Mark and Shaidul feel about it, but um, it's, a, it's a funny word in relation to the Magnum Foundation, as you well know, Noel, because, you know, though we may look big externally, we're actually a very tiny team, of just, um, just a few people, and, and yet we're a very big community. And so I think of Magnum Foundation as more of an extended network and community that people dip into and out of over time, and we're hopefully there as a home base and a source of support. Um, but not a formal institution. And I actually think that distinction is an is a important one because it allows us to keep adapting to whatever the needs are rather than have a fixed sense of what we should be doing in the world. So that's something I wanted to put out there. Um, I also thought it might be useful for the audience to just take a minute to explain the difference between Magnum Foundation and Magnum Photos because I think it's not always um, so clear. <laughs> even to us. Um, so the Magnum Foundation, uh, it, we're in about our 12th year and we're a nonprofit organization, um, an independent organization that was founded by the photographers of Magnum Photos, um, but now uh, run 
independently, though we do have many um, amazing Magnum photographers who are mentors in our program, serve on our board, um, and we're definitely part of the community and contributing to the ideas. Um, but we serve, um, we, we hope to serve the whole um, audience of the community of photographers and those who engage with photography as well. So um, our programs are open, our grants and fellowships are open um, to the broader community. So I just wanted to show a few images um, to give you an orientation to some of the work that we do. Um, <clears throat> And this won't be comprehensive, but hopefully just give you a little bit of an idea. So the Magnum Foundation, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit organization. And our goal is really to expand creativity and diversity in documentary practice. Um, we do that through grant making, through training and mentorship, and through creative collaborations with storytellers who are really pushing the boundaries of how to tell stories about issues related to human rights, social justice, communities, and underrepresented stories. And when we talk about um, expanding creativity and diversity, Noelle and I had a lot of conversations about what that means. And I think one thing that was important to both of us was the idea of both diversity of who's telling the stories, where they're coming from, but also diversity of practice, that there are many different ways to tell stories and helping to support people who are kind of experimenting and pushing at the boundaries of what's possible, um, that it's really those two things are hand in hand, pushing at the boundaries of whose stories we're hearing and seeing and how those get told, how they get distributed in the most creative and innovative way. So we kind of like to think of ourselves as a incubator or a place where people can play and experiment and um, you know um, try out new ideas. So again, we do that through um, supporting new production and that can look like straight up grant making um, over the course of our um, organization's lifetime. We've supported some 500 photographers, um, but we also kind of change what that means over time. This is one of the most recent support stories that we supported. It was actually initiated by Noel with Esther Mbazi from Uganda, working in partnership with um, an organization for women with disabilities. Um, and this year, we've kind of shifted from longer term creative projects with grant making to doing um, editorial partnerships uh, covering the COVID crisis around the world. And this is a series that ran in the Washington Post that drew on our network of photographers in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and we gave a series of about 20 grants for photographers around the world to photograph in their local community what COVID looked like to diversify the picture of what um, the global audiences were seeing in the mainstream media about the impact of COVID around the world. And it was also a very pragmatic adjustment to the fact that people you know, just by necessity had to take a break from some of their long-term creative projects. They couldn't travel, but they still very much needed work. Um, so we're both creative as well as pragmatic, trying to keep people working and getting money out into the field rather than a fewer bigger grants this year. We gave out a lot of grants and, and Noelle before she um, moved over to the New Yorker was really critical to helping conceive that notion of, um, you know, how to keep artists and photographers working during this time of crisis. Um, we also have extensive mentorship and training programs. Um, this is a group of fellows from 2016 editing each other's work. That's actually Esther there, um, second from the right, whose work you saw earlier. Um, and on the far right in the hat is Linda, who's actually now a Magnum nominee. So um, we have a, a number of programs. This is the Photography and Social Justice Program, which runs every year. This is the lineup of this year's Photography and Social Justice Fellows. Um, it's an open application process, an international program. Normally it's a residency here in New York City where Magnum Foundation is based, but last year and this year it's running online, um, but it's still a very intensive and, and creative um, project that gives photographers extended long-term mentorship. The mentors in this, the program this year are 
Simchian, Nusha Tavakolian, and So Rob Kura. Um, also, um, Meng Wen Thao, who was a, a fellow with us, is now teaching in the program. So there's this nice continuity of um, people who participate in the programs who then go on to be mentors in other programs. Um, and that's the case with this program as well. The four images I'm showing you are the mentors in our Arab documentary photography program, or um, two of the mentors and two of this year's um, teaching assistants. Uh, we have Tanya Habjoka on the top left, Rhonda Shoth on the top, top right, who are two of the mentors in the program. And this year for the first time we included former fellows from that program, Nadia Beseso from Jordan on the left bottom and Heba Khalifa from the bottom on the bottom right from Egypt. Um, so this is a program that we run in partnership with the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture in Beirut um, and also the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands. And it supports 10 or this past year, 11 photographers from the Middle East and North Africa, again, based in Beirut. Um, Noel has been to the workshop a number of times. This also has had to be online. But I think what was relevant and the reason I put in the two pictures by Nadia and Heba is I'm thinking a lot about this idea, again, of how to support artists through grants and mentorships, but then also to sustain them as they move into other phases of their practice. So I think creating this extended network where photographers enter at a a junior level and then are engaged in mentoring and training other photographers, in many cases setting up collectives or institutions or organizations in their own communities. Um, you know, it's, it's extending this web of support for a field that we know is incredibly challenging, incredibly dis dispersed and hard to make a living. Um, so another, another zone of our work is um, experimentation and new ideas. I talked about sort of thinking of our work as an incubator for people who are pressing at the boundaries of creative practice. Um, and that can look like either a lot of experimentation with new technology. We have a partnership with the Brown Center for Media Innovation at Columbia. And we run a series of um, labs where photographers can experiment with new technological platforms. We have an, a series coming up of three workshops in the coming year on the theme of counter histories. So photographers looking back at narratives over time um, and reframing them through photographs. This is something that I know Mark has done in his work as well, take a different course through history. And in fact, looking at you, Mark, I'm thinking of the notion that this investigation of counter histories that we've embarked on for a few years at the Magnum Foundation was actually inspired by a conversation that we had in your office at Autograph, talking about your work, looking back into the Magnum archives and their coverage of Africa over time and your investigations in the Getty archive and the idea of decolonizing the archive. You know, what do the archives tell us when we look back about what's there, what's missing, what different stories can we tell other than what the archive intended us to see, I think is an incredibly interesting idea. Maybe one will pick up in our conversation. So that experimentation can also look like public artwork. This is a project um, that we partnered on with an artist named Emily Schiffer in Chicago um, a few years ago that related to participatory budgeting. So photographers putting images in public spaces and then community residents being able to um, vote about the allocation of city resources, how to engage communities through the use of images. Um, and then I think more than anything, what's been on my mind these past months and weeks and over the past year is the idea of community and how you sustain that in a time of crisis, how you sustain that among a dispersed network and community. Um, and starting in just the weeks after shutdown, um, we started community calls for our network you can see one of the a Zoom screenshot on the left of one of those. You can see Noel in the upper left there, um, as well as other members of our team and um, photographers who've been in our programs over time from our photography and social justice program, from our Middle East programs, grantees. Um, I mean, I could tell you a story about each one of the faces on here, but I won't go down that rabbit hole. But suffice it to say that these are people who, some of them, 
worked with us 10 years ago and some of them uh, you know, are in a current program now. But what we really wanted to do is to create a way where people could gather, we could hear what their needs were and adjust our work to support what their needs are. We could give them not just financial resources, but um, workshops and trainings about trauma and photographing safely in times of COVID, what editors were looking for at this time, um, ethical practice is a key consideration. So really trying to sustain that network over time. Um, and this was on my mind again, just earlier this week when we invited back to speak to that extended network, two of our past fellows. So, and one of them, Mu Yi Zhao, was a former Magnum Foundation fellow and has now gone on to be one of the multimedia editors at the New York Times. And she showed us the project in the top center here, a tanker in a maze of companies, one way illicit oil reaches North Korea, which is incredible, intensive research-based pro project that she worked on with her team at the New York Times, and I encourage you to check it out, um, where they're looking at the um, sort of tracking of oil going from Chinese companies into North Korea. And it was just so interesting to see how somebody who started as a photographer, came through our programs, worked with us in different capacities on her own project, has now wound up being an editor um, in a totally different mode of practice, but is coming back to speak to current fellows and, and um, grantees about the different paths that your work can take, how you can continue your own creative practice in many different ways, um, and showing that sort of different route that one can take as a practitioner. And I think it was, a, it was just a great moment of cycling back for us. And we've had so many of those this year of seeing photographers that we've supported again, come back and teach in other programs, um, do these editorial partnerships, mentor each other. Um, but I think that's part of what it means um, for us in this time uh, to be, uh, you know, acting as an organization that's trying to provide networks of support and also trying to change the face and the participation in this field is that people don't need necessarily one-time grants or one-time mentorship and program. They need a network that they can draw on over time. And that doesn't mean a closed community. It doesn't mean an agency um, or a club, but a place where you can go to for resources, you can connect with other people. Um, and hopefully that's some of what we're doing here today. And when I look at both Mark and Shahi Duel, I think of that as well, I, I think of both their institutions, but they're both so much more than their institutions in the way that they've provided um, extended, you know, array of support for practitioners over time and a real, really a place that people can go to and look to um, for what it means to do a different kind of work in this field. So I really look forward to talking more with both of you and Noel, who's also um, totally committed to this idea as well. So maybe I'll leave it there and turn it over to Shayi Duol. Thank you, Kristen. Um, this idea of capacity building is incredibly important. We'll, we'll pick that back up in discussion. Shahi Duol, are you good to share your screen? Uh, I'll, I'll just talk for a bit and I'll go to my screen later, I think. Perfect. Um, you see me on the screen, you see my name, and you identify a bearded Muslim man of possibly Asian origin. And that comes with a lot of baggage um, from people inching away ever so slightly on the seat next to you, to people avoiding eye contact, but casting quick glances. Uh, I'm the patriarch, I'm the terrorist, uh, you know how I treat women. Uh, and this is all before you begin to analyze uh, the clothes I wear or my accent. You know, uh, it's not all negative. Sometimes people are quite nice. They, they sort of say, oh, you speak such good English. Uh, you know, uh, not when I'm wearing a kefir or in this particular context, a watermelon. So that's more interesting, but more difficult uh, to show my solidarity with Palestine. But, you know, that's that's what happens. They say, yeah, you look really look, speak good English. If I 
if I was talking to you on the phone, I wouldn't have. And then that's when they realize that they're falling into a trap of some sort and they begin to fidget a little bit. Uh, but th that's the terrain I'm talking about. You know, where the associations are so strong. Uh, being from Bangladesh, obviously, I'm an icon of poverty. Uh, but I also have a difficult balancing act to play because, you know, uh, living where I do, where there's so much repression, I, I critique my government, I critique my, my nation in some ways, uh, yet um, that's not how I want it to be. I mean, I, I'm a proud Bangladeshi who wants to say things which are good about my country, and there are plenty of those. But then uh, it, it's, it's um, I don't want to be into propaganda either. So before I do that, before I move into the images, I, I, I maybe I'll try and place some context into the organization I run in terms of uh, what we've done to the space where we work in. What I'm showing you is a timeline developed by Naim Mohammed. He showed it in Chobimala 9. Uh, it's what was Chobimala and what comes next. It's going to be, I think, shown in uh, Art and Its World's exhibition. Uh, there, there's a large number of other collaborators. I can't, I don't have the time to give everyone's names, but perhaps we'll have a chance to do that later on. Let me try and share my screen uh, and see what works. Is this working? Yeah, I've selected that. I do a share. So if you can see this, this is what Naim was talking about at that time. Uh, so we did quite a lot of research and uh, looking to see what our intervention had actually meant to Bangladesh, to the scene, uh, in particularly the photographic scene in Bangladesh. I mean, uh, uh, when I came to Bangladesh, I initially joined the Bangladesh Photographic Society, which was a camera club. And, you know, camera clubs are pretty much the same in the United States and Iran, except that they don't have naked women by waterfalls in Iran. But otherwise, they're pretty pictures, solarization, special effects, awards being won and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I, I began at that time uh, the work. I mean, firstly, I, I was not known as a photojournalist uh, and no one was going to give me work as a photojournalist. So I started doing commercial work, but my personal work was the work I was doing in the streets, um, trying to bring down. I had left Bangladesh, an independent nation. I came back to find that a military general had taken over. So it was really as an activist uh, that I began working in the streets. Um, and at that time, there was, uh, and I'll show you that picture later on, uh, there was a young man called Nur Hussein who was killed by the police on the 10th of November 1987. Uh, and I began a body of work uh, which uh, looked at the resistance. Uh, it critiqued the regime. And of course, my work couldn't be shown anywhere. Uh, we found other ways to show the work. Uh, and when we actually, when the general actually came down on the 5th of December 1990, we decided we would show it in a gallery. And the very galleries that had turned down our work earlier on, because it was so political, now opened, opened it, their doors to it. We showed some work and um, work that people were dying to see because this was their movement and they hadn't seen any of these images. Uh, we had near riots uh, at the exhibit uh, and we, anticipate something like 400,000 people came to see our show in three and a half days that we had open. Um, then, um, you know, we, we had this election. And of course, throughout this period, we, I was trying to show work, send it out there, try and get it published. No one was interested. You know, a democratic movement in Bangladesh just wasn't interesting. In 91, uh, there was, and here in between, we'd set up DRIC in 1989. Then uh, we began to publish in 90, in 91 was when, uh, you know, this movement had culminated into a fair free election, one of the very few we've ever had. But no one was interested in that story. We had a cyclone on the 29th of April, 91, 
And we were inundated by requests for pictures. The New York Times and other people, you know, uh, it was a good opportunity for us. But we then said, yes, that's happened, but that's not the story we want to talk about. It's a, it's a different story. Uh, I, I won't spend time on that. Very soon afterwards, Mark Seeley comes in. Uh, I'd met him earlier on uh, at, at Brixton, I think it was, Mark, at that time. Um, and we were doing some work which uh, was about this uh, struggle for democracy. And Sunil Gupta showed this work in uh, the Photographer's Gallery. Mark and I, we got together. And we realized that really the identity of my country was to a very, very large extent being formulated by white Western photographers who came in and regurgitated these cyclone pictures. So we built an agency which was going to be our own storytelling platform. Uh, but even there, I mean, I began to question my own position as a middle class male photographer. Uh, the power was very much in my hands. And at that time, there weren't very many others besides that. So Mark and I, uh, we began collaborating and we put together, uh, well, Mark helped bring over a woman photographer, Poluma Desai, who came over and ran a workshop. We set up the first women's collective uh, and they showed at the largest gallery in the country. It, it was a group called Ono Chekedaka. We brought in World Press Photo for the first time. We showed work which had never been shown before uh, because people who, Bangladeshis who documented our war had difficult pictures, pictures we didn't go, go well with the propaganda. So they didn't feel that it was safe to show their work. So we began to convince them, no, we have to show our own work at some point. But while that's going on, we're also looking at this issue of representation. Certainly women needed to be photographers and storytellers, but also working class people, because the media was very much upper middle class, middle class. So we started teaching uh, working class children photography. We were isolated. We didn't even have an international telephone line. So we introduced email at a time in order to be able to stay relevant. I mean, we'd set up shop in Dhaka, uh, far away from New York, Paris, and London, where the marketplaces were. So if you're in Bangladesh, you have to find some way to stay engaged. So we set up, you know, it, it's, it was do, DIY pretty much. You need email, you build an email network. Uh, then we tried to do our first festival. Uh, and the week we were going to do our festival, we had uh, a huge uh, hartal, which is the national strike, which was for the entire week of our festival. So it pretty much went out of the window. But we had other ways of staying engaged. We then did a show called Positive Lives. It was about HIV and AIDS. And it was the first time we were able to show we showed pictures of gay people on our walls. So in lots of ways, we were trying to break taboos. Then the next year in, nine, in 2000, uh, we, showed, we produced a calendar on sex workers. Sex workers had always been this taboo area, but that they were also people they had stories to tell. So we did an entire calendar dedicated to the lives of sex workers. We launched Bangla Rights, uh, our human rights network in 2001. And pretty soon after that, the government closed down all our telephone lines as we critiqued the military. So all of these things keep coming in. I mean, Naeem has also put in some of these technological uh, bookmarks along the way, for instance, Blackberry launching and other things, but we began to publish. We produced the first Bangla book on anthropology. Then we launched uh, an agency called Majority World, uh, a term which I'd introduced in the early 90s because people called us third world. <coughs> that was not an identity we'd chosen for ourselves. And we certainly didn't choose you to be first world and us third world. So we said, okay, we are the majority of humankind. We'll call ourselves majority world. And we set up an agency called Majority World, which is going to represent photographers from Latin America, Africa, Asia, and also indigenous uh, communities in the North. Uh, then uh, we started bringing out our, other, our own books uh, on photojournalism and things like that. Um, then 
I'll move forward a little bit because I want to show you some other things, but I'll just go through. In 1998, we set up the School of Photography, Hachala, because uh, we realized if, if you've got to fight a war, uh, you've got to uh, you know, have warriors. Uh, so the school was the way we did, did it. Uh, it was done in a funny sort of way. I, at that time, I, got, I was very involved with World Press Photo. We were going to have a World Press Photo seminar in Bangladesh. It was three three-day seminars separated by a year in between. I said, that's never going to work. He said, well, that's how the budget is. You know, that's how we designed the pro project. So I thought rather than throw out the baby with the bathwater, I'll take advantage of it. So Reza Degati, Chris Boot came over. They did a wonderful three-day workshop. They went away. And for 263 days, the poor students had me working with them until the next workshop. And then it was uh, another two... Reza actually came every year, and Rob Manford, uh, uh, and Chris Boot, and Robert Pledge, they all turned us in. Uh, but we did this, we, we ran this school, and by that time, we had two years of schooling, and the students were really doing fabulous work. That was the time we decided uh, we needed a festival of our own. Uh, we'd had that aborted one earlier on, but this time we prepared better, and we thought, what better way to do this festival than to have a show on the War of Liberation? This was really so close to our hearts. We planned this show. We showed it at the museum. Uh, we were going to show it at the museum. But the night before the opening, the minister rings me up to say, some of those pictures must go. Uh, because we had shown the war as it was. And pretty much every war has a lot of bad things. And both sides do lots of bad things. We did too. Uh, and we showed the war as it was, not the government propaganda. The government wasn't interested in that. So we pulled a show from the National Museum. Uh, Polly Hope, a British artist, was showing at our own gallery, rang up Polly at the middle of the night to say, sorry, Polly, your show's got to go. She was upset, but once she knew why it was, she went ahead with it. So we showed, we, everything we've done has been a bit like that, you know. Um, it's been at loggerhead with the establishment. We've tried to set up things. But for me, what's interesting is that we are now at a stage where having been anti-establishment all our lives, we have in some ways become the establishment. And that's, that's worrying. You begin to think of whether you've sold out or not, whether your identity has shifted. But we, we recognize that we need it. Uh, that when the institutions are not being built and you need to have really long-term things, you need to build institutions of your own. So we built these organizations, but we took a chapter of Mark Seeley. I mean, we saw the building that he'd done. So we decided we need a building of our own. So let me see if I can find that building. So here is a 10 story building, which is our very own. It houses the agency. Shahidu, one moment. Yeah. I want to make sure we are seeing it because we're seeing that beautiful. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, I, I, I right. Thank you. I've got to uh, change the screen again. Uh, oh, whoop. I What's love this now? timeline. It's beautiful. Okay, well, you've got to watch it for a bit longer unless I can <laughs> find a way to switch the screen. Uh, where are we now? I can't switch the screen. Uh, Maybe stop the share. Ah, oh, and then okay, reshare. Good. Start again. Okay, thank you. That I think will work. We share screen again. I need someone to help me. Yes, exactly. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Uh, tell me if I'm running out of time. Um, it's not the right screen. I've shared the wrong one. I'm going to stop this one. But that's an interesting story. That is a little girl called Karina who I met and she was the one who was very surprised because uh, she saw I had coins in my pocket and was perplexed because, can you see this now? Um, yes. Do you see? What is yes. This? Do you is see this a dollhouse? This oh, is the dollhouse, the dollhouse okay. of our building. And we're gonna go right to the top, to the rooftop of our building. Let's see if you can make it happen. Um, um, it's not happening very quickly. 
let's see if we do floor selector. Does that work? Uh, I'm going to try again. Ah, yeah. So that's the rooftop of our building, which is a show on COVID-19, which was done by a former student. Um, let's go down a bit. Uh, I'm not very good at this, particularly when it's online. And oh, it's what do you closed. mean? This is fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, but it's wonderful see. to see this modeled out this way. No, but it's OK. Let's see if this works. You know, um, the net isn't working well enough. I'm going to, oh yeah, it is. So let's try, let's see if we can go down the stairs. That might be quicker than me trying to navigate where I don't know how to navigate. So this is the stairway of our gallery, uh, of the building and we're going down it. Let's go down further if you can. And one of the things we did was photography is pretty much the untouchable within the art field in Bangladesh. You know, painters are the Brahmins, we're the untouchables. And until recently, we couldn't even show photography and video in the government of Biennale. Uh, they do now. What, what we've done, interestingly, is we have actually turned the whole thing around. We now are the major festival in town, the biggest art event and we've made it inclusive. So as you can see, we have art practitioners, sound artists, uh, painters, sculptors, all working with us. Now I'm gonna take you into our studio. This is our studio. Eat your heart out, Mark. Uh, so you see a whole range of very, very different types of work. This is actually uh, we should have shown you a video. This is a breathing thing that opens out and comes in. Um, a whole range of different work. This is by Hadiuddin looking at an old studio. Um, let's see if I can go to the basement. Otherwise, I'm going to take up too much time. Um, I've not done it very well. View dollhouse. Let's go to the basement. Ah, this is our basement. This is one of the basements. And the point I'm trying to make really is that this is our very own space. And I'm not going to show you the other pictures. The reason uh, for us, it was very important. When, uh, how am I doing for time? I'm running out now. Maybe just a few more minutes so we can okay. make sure all of you have a chance. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, mention very briefly once I was jailed on 5th of August, I was actually sitting literally on this chair when uploading stuff, when the doorbell rang, I opened the door and these burly people came in, dragged me away. I got handcuffed, blindfolded, tortured. I'm, that's a small part of the story. But while I was in jail, we decided we would have the next festival. We didn't know if I was going to come out. We didn't know when I was going to come out. We decided we'd have it. At that time, we had the carcass of the building. And we decided that would be our venue because of course no other no one would touch us at that time so we used the skeleton of this building as our festival and this year round we use the completed building as our festival and now we have our own space and what we're doing within this space is we are creating a safe space for activists for artists for journalists so they know that there is one place in bangladesh where they can say things that they're not able to say anywhere else. And when we did that festival, this was shortly after this very repressive government had come in through a rigged election. And we had the opening event, which was about freedom of thought and expression in South Asia. And people who had nothing to do with the arts said, we've got to learn from this. How come when the entire nation is silent, an art event, a festival, can be saying things that no one else is able to say. And I think that at the end is what we're about. Art is how we do it because it works, but that's not the point of the exercise. We're a seat of resistance, we're a movement. I'll stop there, thank you. Oh, so inspiring, incredible. I feel so blessed to have been able to go and see. Um, 
and you know, I think if this is just a pen I can put in for later, this question of a brick and mortar space. I think is fascinating. And I'd love for us to discuss that a little bit in context of Magnum Foundation also autograph. So Shahidul, thank you so much. Always inspirational to listen to you speak and congratulations on that gorgeous building. Can't wait to see it in person someday. Um, Mark, if you wanna go ahead and take it away um, to share your screen. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, I, I would like to say that um, you know, Shahidal and um, building institutions is, um, I think uh, it's easy, relatively easy from, um, well, not easy, but very different political kind of climate in terms of, so it's, it's non-comparable really in terms of where you are politically and the vulnerabilities that you face and the, um, and the difficulties and the barriers that you have in, in terms of what we face here. They're very, they're, they're certainly very different, but they are very aligned uh, politically in terms of um, ideas of visibility and, and freedom, I suppose. You know, one of the key things I think um, is that we, what we've been trying to do here from say 1988 and beyond then, I, I would argue from the end of World War II, <laughs> actually, if I'm, if I'm really honest, is to, is to get, is, is, is to realign some degree of um, a social contract, a human rights contract, where, you know, after the devastation of that period, we, you know, the world was supposed to reset. The world was supposed to turn around and say, actually, that's the end of all this evil. And we're going to have a universal declaration of human rights. And we're all going to march collectively towards a kind of new human spirit. And we're never going to, you know, um, we're never going to experience you know, devastation at that level before again and i think you know the the idea of how the world was seen literally through images etc was a is a kind of key point how we're all framed you know men women queer straight working class this idea that this 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 idea that in in this period in time that we've all been framed in a very particular way that we've become fixed and photography's relationship to those kind of colonialities and those imperial those imperial um um epistemes through the lens of you know fixed us in, in a very particular way where that absolutely anchors into you know the the way that you introduced yourself you know Shahidal it's like who do you think I am I've often said that you know when people when people meet me or whatever that I'm, I'm not the type of person that you think I am you've got no idea who I am you have no idea how why why, why how do you necessarily you know, think I'm this you know, framed in this way and I always ask, I always ask people to think about, you know, close your eyes and think about Bangladesh. What kind of image comes up? Close your eyes and think about North America. Close your eyes and say woman. Close your eyes and say queer. Close your eyes and say black man. Close your eyes and say black woman. See what kind of image comes up. And I bet there's a huge amount shared in those kind of images if we're all kind of honest about that in terms of the first thing that, that flushes up. So this idea of race rights and representation really, we've been mining through a kind of academic field here. At, you know, autograph. We were very fortunate, to, of course, to have, you know, cultural studies through the lens of people like Stuart Hall, great thinkers like Paul Gilroy, you know, contemporary activists like Coburn and Mercer, and you know, bell hooks, and you know, great, great, great cultural theorists that we were all kind of joining up to in this, trying to find this other voice, and it was very much about another voice. And I've often said that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not that interested in photography it's, itself. You know, I'm not, I'm not a darkroom person or. A, or, or, you know, I'm not interested in lens, but I am interested in, you know, the work images doing culture. And I think that's, that's the really important place for where autograph sits. It's like, well, what can we do about this massive wave, this kind of image sphere, if you like, of negative images that surround so many of the world's citizens? It's a kind of devastating kind of arc of visual gravity that is kind of put on people as they try and move through, through the world. So a kind of sense of pushback, a kind of representational um, um, marker, a contestation, a kind of unfinished conversation, um, you know, always moving towards some degree of trying to um, offer a transgression, if you like, in terms of what people imagine is the, the norm around representational politics has been part of what we've been very much about. You know, the, the first of all, we start in terms of the institution, it starts with, you know, lobbying as we do as lobbying for funds, lobbying for a voice. And these, you, you know, every time you say something about where something began, someone else will tell you something. So 
autograph and, and black cultural politics in the UK, like, like I suppose anywhere, is a multi-headed hydra. It has lots of important voices. Some people said one thing which made a huge difference. And some people said a lot of things that made hardly any difference. But what made the difference is that kind of sense of, you know, what Kirsten was talking about, this sense of being in a collective voice, this sense of being in the room, this sense of being able to embody some sense of political change. You know, that goosebump moment when you finally hear someone say something that you can identify with, which says, gosh, I wish I'd said that. Gosh, they're kind of like speaking for me. That's really where I want to get close to that kind of whirlwind, that epicenter of kind of change. And when you're young, that's a huge magnet, that kind of whirling, swirling political place that you want to get pulled into the center of. And occasionally, and especially in the UK around 1988, 89, there was this, you know, push back towards Thatcherism, that London wasn't the place for many people that they were casting it. We were all these other outsiders. There was kind of queer politics. There was Derek Jarman. There was Isaac Julian. There was all kinds of, you know, alignments. There was the miners' strike. There was people's social housing has been taken away. There was the, you know, Greater London Council. You know, there was ethnic minority arts practice. There was free rock punk concerts in the park. There was squatting. There was, you know, places to be in a city that you felt as though that you could survive. Somehow you could get by. People were picking up cameras and trying to narrate their own stories. And they were pushing back fundamentally into those white cube spaces. They wanted the door open. They wanted the path open, as Stuart Hall would say. And they wanted to have their narrated parts of that story held up and valued rather than always been this marginal other space. So all these margins, especially in the cities like London, Manchester, Bristol, became the potential place for riot. And they did happen. You know, these, these things blew up. You know, streets were burned. People were protesting. The regimes of difference, the barriers that were in place, the blue uniforms, the kind of soldier authorities that were holding people back were contested and thought. So this was the kind of environment, really. And somehow, you know, you got through the gaps, the barriers that were there. People pushed, you know, when you get this kind of like weight behind you, some people just about squeezed on through or some agencies just about managed to survive that place. And you could have, you know, what was when we met Shahidal, you know, a phone on a desk in a small building and you called yourself, you know, an institution or autographed the Association of Black ph Photographers. And he looked around, actually, and there was two filing cabinets, some volunteers, no money in the bank and, you know, a desire to kind of try and get things done. Railway lines outside the door. It was incredibly unprofessional, but the desire was there. And the desire didn't meet everybody, you know, like all kind of movements, I suppose, are all kind of collective bodies. People fall in and out of love with each other. People are literally in and out of bed with each other. People are literally, you know, saying, you've taken this from me. I mean, there was a whole kind of, you know, furore around, you know, feeding frenzies around, especially if something's funded that people want to be part of. And all those differences somehow meant that, you know, there's a, I suppose, an energy, <laughs> an energy of kind of, you know, an energy of kind of making where, you know, people borrowed a camera from somebody, you know, and also people died, right? So people like Rotomi Fanny Kuri, who were very important to this arts organization, you know, they, they pass away as they're, as they're hit within another pandemic, which we often forget the one around HIV and AIDS, which wiped out so many good kind of creative, creative voices, you know, and it was also where a place where, you know, photographers like Maxine Walker would walk into a ridiculously small room called a meeting and say, well, if there ain't enough black women in this room, I'm leaving, right? That's enough. You know, you guys can't have any more. And there was unreconstructed kind of, you know, um, documentary work where people thought they could just walk around the world, had the right to, to say, I'm representing my community. And people would say, but you're not from my community. How can you do it? So all these really big questions about who sees who, who represents, were part of the DNA of what we were thinking about. You know, from, from Victor Bergen and the, uh, the postmodernist debate, it was a huge more of a kind of theoretical place, a way of, way, a way of being. And the photography, if you like, was just one of the languages which was being picked up in, in, in that space. And I realized actually that, you know, if we, um, I mean, one of, the, one, one of the realities, one of the realities is, is that finance is essential to all this stuff. There's nothing without any money. So the, the whole idea of lobbying for cash, that's just a given. You've got to find that stuff. You've got to find somehow, you've got to do your application forms. You've got to meet the criteria. And to tend to get money, you've got to somehow 
meet the kind of you know the constitutional frameworks that these institutions want you to be in. So you've got to get good governance in place. You've got to have all these you know structural things that mean that you can become and be run. You can be audited. You can have bank accounts. You can have accountable people. You can go have those things in place. These are all things that we were all you know making sure or trying to learn our way through as well. Because th there's no rules, right? In many of this stuff, you're just learning as you go through. I guess the most important thing is that we were prepared. A few of us prepared to learn that stuff, to try and do that stuff, to replicate those institutions. And I've always been a grand, you know, that, that the idea of being a Gramsci, if you like, or working through guys, well, both in the institution and against it, right? It's like, how do you do that? So you learn that if you're gonna survive in an institutional way, you have to kind of do, do you have to compromise, I suppose, to some degree. And you have to be incredibly uh, contradictory. You have to be able to turn around and, uh, and, and, and almost, eat yourself at times for the things that you have to do to get the thing further down the road because if it becomes about um a frozen hardcore political space of making then we wouldn't have got that much done and i think one of the benefits of autograph is that you was using this idea of a kind of black political space as a non-fixed space right it was an idea space it was not about just about you know the epidermal schema of things it was an ideological space, which meant that there was an, an, a pretty non-essential space that we were open and trying to be inclusive around blackness as a political space that embodied lots of differences. This is why we use the word different and difference a lot within that space. So to de-homogenize the work was really, really, really in, in, important. And at the beginning, in terms of our agency, exhibitions, as we all know, are really difficult to find, to make, to, 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 um, to curate um to get in the, into the world so of course commissioning and making and publishing were essential to what we're doing it's like you know people would be coming and saying you know um uh, but but you know publishing how do you make any money from it my idea around publishing was not to make any money was to leave a legacy was to leave something fundamentally behind was to leave an, an isbn number and to park that at the british museum was a massive benefit to having something that was left behind because also during this time, during the 1980s and early 90s, there was lots of things popping up and disappearing. Small arts organizations on say Seven Sisters Road, black arts collectives, things are popping up and dying all the time. Lots of things were unsustainable because in many ways, the environment of which people were making things in was so precarious, so fragile, so hard to sustain, so self-centered, so wrapped around an individual. Shahil, you and I have spoke about this a lot around, you know, the burden of kind of carrying the, the, these, uh, these moments through the lens of, say, you know, of, you know, a charismatic character in the center. It's like, how do you break that space through? And sometimes when those characters can't make it anymore, things, things, things can fall, fall apart. So I've always been aware of trying to, you know, work with different curators, work in different institutions, kind of, if you like, polyverse the kind of spread of the things that we're involved in. And that's why I'm very pleased with, say, you know, the work that Reni Musai does for us as a kind of curatorial kind of leader in that space. The, the voice that she adds is very different for the voice that I have, but we kind of amplify each other's work through the lens of this organization, employing freelance curators to do different things that we might not do. To guess what, to, to encourage artists or to, to work with artwork that we don't even understand. It's like, I don't know what this means, but if I don't know what it means, then maybe I'm gonna go on a learning curve here and to not be this kind of authoritative figure that has all the answers, but at least be open to the stuff that people are trying to give us. And if I sense I've always, or if I've felt, or if they're convinced enough arguments behind it, or if the research has been done, then we have something new to share, right? And I think that's a really important way of trying to be open around what ideas of race, rights, and representational politics and human rights mean. It's like, what's been excluded here? You know, so when I came to uh, Bangladesh and I realized that actually the Bangladesh story is a British story in a funny kind of way. It's tied into 1947. It's tied into those imperial navs. It's tied into those colonial stuff. And I've got the biggest Bangladeshi community outside of Bangladesh on my doorstep. It would be crazy to open a new building without having that project in this building as such, right? So it's like the, the conversations are not, they're based on understanding those kind of historical kind of trajectories and those connections that we have. And I think as institutions, we have a try and have a responsibility to do that. I mean, I guess one of the things about being an institution that's also open to these, uh, as Kirsten says, these communities or these collective ideas or these spaces is that often there's not that many of you and they're like magnets and lots of 
people from marginalized spaces flood to you and they want you to be the thing that they want you to be but you can't be all these things at all times to all people it's an oppositional politics is like that those kind of conservative spaces with their shops and their museums and their gift shops at the end they're kind of cruising spaces for tourists if you like they can be anything to anyone because they just sell anybody they're a day out but if we've got meaning in politics in our work then they're very they're very they're often people with very sharp pencils come to you and there can be very poignant conversations that can be had and they can hurt right they can really hurt and the other thing i wanted to just just put in the table is it's okay to talk about build, building institutions but they are wearing on everybody who tries to do something different in this space right they age you they tax you you know they can bring you down and they can also you know become intensely unpleasurable trying to shift the barriers or, or the dynamic along it's kind of hard work in your case shahil you can end up you know in life-threatening situations i remind people that you haven't just been imprisoned but you've been you know you've had a couple of near-death experiences through through uh, physical bodily harm you know by 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 I've been stabbed you know several times so it's you know the, the, this is the risk that you're in and when when I see you there and I sit here and I talk about this stuff I haven't quite had had had, a, had that kind of that sense of risk that you that, that 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 you live with every day that that threat and that's what change looks like that's what change is and I think you know maybe as we the sad thing about maybe some of our workers in Cheadle you know is that we might be getting nearer to that sense of uh, you know the edge for some of the the institutions that become more emboldened as the right wing becomes increasingly stronger the edge of going over is you know sometimes closer than we feel can feel comfortable with the things that we're you know prepared to say and do and become more vulnerable in, in that sense so we've been very lucky here i'm going to talk about these we've been very lucky here we've grown you know we've we we've commissioned people we've started the collection we've had great conversations with uh, with, with, with 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 colleagues worldwide one of the key things I tried to do was to was to in, invent a black Brit, British political perspective overseas. We were much more successful overseas than we were in the UK at first. I mean, I've have been told on several occasions that the work we've been done at Autograph is irrelevant, but that's by major institutions and gallery directors. There's no point in naming who some of those people were because I'm not interested in that world at all. But you know, you, you there are there are moments of not you do know that you're, you sometimes feel as though you, you have been at the end of the funding food chain you know it's like there's a bit left maybe go and see what you can do with that obviously moments like last year and you know the killing of George Floyd you know and the Black Lives Matter things get amplified but I also sometimes feel as though the, the arc of these cycles go round and round and the voices and the names change but the politics of that dynamic shift I hope but you know I feel as though we are in the same place sometimes so that can be a little bit depressing if you know what I mean we 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 we're, I'm very now I am concerned with bricks and mortar the reason why we built a building is because we it was very simple very practical we moved offices about four or five times in a in a in a, in a, in a five-year period because we we couldn't get a lease that that would be secure enough right it was a Every time we settled down, someone was saying your lease is up and you've got to move. You couldn't build anything because you couldn't afford anything as such. So the idea is that we have to stop that, right? And we know that one of the key things around imperial ideologies, Shield, Kirsten, Noel, is that if you don't own anything in our cultures, then you have nothing, right? I mean, the people that have suffered most on the planet on every level are those that are nomadic, right? If you don't say that's mine, and if you don't start putting a fence around it, then you'd never had it. So as an indigenous person, you can't live in the forest because you go down the fence. As an Aboriginal person in any shape or form, or someone who's who's got a nomadic sense of their own, own being, you, you have to own things. And I was very aware of a simple fact that the more you have in terms of bricks and mortar and capital assets, the harder it is for people to take them away from you. And at least then, if you do have that asset, you've got something to maybe sell and in the kind of western capitalist society that's where the kind of you know part of the respect lives part of building the institution lives so although i recognize that institutions are inherently conservative that's absolutely right that we are in danger in many instances of replicating the horrible power structures that are at play within them but what they do do especially in the uk 
is that they people recognize you through them. They see the building as somewhere to maybe go. And if you can flip the coin and be incredibly generous with the politics that you put on and display within those spaces, you can hopefully become a place of uh, what I'm saying is of curatorial care. We care for things differently here. You know, I like the idea that, you know, we have some of some artists work that is now what I would say at rest. Rotimi Fanny Kyoti's work sleeps in this building very well. You know, it rests, we care for it. When it needs feeding, we take it out and we nurture it. And it's been growing since he died. And I think if there's one piece of work that I'm particularly proud of, it's that care work that we that we that we do at a great and that care work is from the front door to an octogenarian old West Indian who's never been in a gallery before, to a young artist who's like saying, thank you very much. I didn't imagine my future could be like this. And I think that's what institution enables you to do. It enables you also in one last point to look into the face of a stranger and welcome them into your home. <laughs> wow, so much there. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, where, where do we start? I mean, I guess maybe, maybe picking up on this question of um, care, um, I wanna kind of open this up because I also know the, the work that Magnum Foundation does in terms of um, practitioners and support what Autograph has done, and of course, Shahidul, what Kashtawa does, um, maybe care relative to the space. I also would love to hear um, Shahidul and Kristen's thoughts on this kind of brick and mortar and, and what you all think about this and its value. Maybe starting with Kristen. Yeah, and actually, um, if you don't mind me turning that around and asking a question to my fellow panelists, one thing that um, occurs to me when I hear Mark talk about this incredible history that he has lived and built and Shahidul as well, you know, you both come to this place, you didn't decide to just start an institution or build an institution, you lived lives that, you know, brought you to this place and you built these things over time. And um, I wonder, uh, what you think about the role beyond, beyond you. You know, you, Mark, talked about like when, and the fact that the two of you have had conversations about when you are a charismatic leader who represents the organization to so many people and so many people look to you and flock to you and want it to be something for them. There's a, I think a great um, weight there must be on both of you to, represent your institutions, but also to think about how, what they mean beyond you. And I wonder if that's something that you're thinking about. I'm in a different position because I didn't, I wasn't the founder of the organization that I now serve and I'm a part of. It was a collective of photographers and Susan Micellis, who's on the conversation with us here today, is really the light that charged that. Um, but I'm stepping into that and trying to continue that because the community feels essential to people and of value to people, but it's a different thing when it's your story and your narrative and you're so entwined with the institution. And I wonder, I'd love to hear the two of you speak about that, the relationship between your own story, your own history and how, you know, what that means and what you hope or think about the life of the organization beyond you. Or whether it doesn't matter. I mean, you could also say, you know, these, these initiatives are a project in a moment in time and they exist when they exist. Um, and if they're not a value, maybe they're not, but. I was just gonna yeah. say, Kristen, it, it, you know, autograph, as I said, is a kind of multi-hydrate beast. There's lots of voices that make it. And I think it's wrong to kind of say that, you know, I'm a founder or own it in any shape or form. What I've done is I've cared for it <laughs> for, for, for a bit because the opportunity to care for it was there. I mean, there've been many risks in there. I mean, I've, I very rarely say this, but you know, you know, you do, the, the, the house has been on the line. One's personal, one's personal house has been on the line to keep the thing going. You know, these are, these, are, these are things which are beyond the job. So you do have this, 
this these investments in this like well how do you stay how do you keep these things afloat you know it's not they, they're not they're not they're not games they're political you know youth and naivety are also incredible things but i think you know you you are what you've got to do is i think every institution has to do it anyway it's like succession planning isn't it it's like that's if you if you don't start thinking if you imagine you're invincible this is one of the things that that um <laughs> i'm sorry i'm laughing before i say it. it's one of the things that this is one of the things that i think that white men do very well <laughs> they imagine that they're invincible and that everything they're going to do is going to live forever right i think when you've kind of caught up in a sense of um collective and community and uh thinking oh my god how how fragile this is how where's the money you know the economy of what you do you think well what happens if I'm not here? And you know, and when you, it's a bit like a family, it's a bit like if you have kids, it's like, what happens if I'm not here? You're always thinking, what contingencies are in place? We live in a contingency see, world. So I think we're, I am always thinking about what the future of, of this thing will be. And the building's part of that. The building is like, well, if we can't sustain it, there's something to sell. The thing goes on, something has to go on, you know, and things are, I, I'm hoping that, um, and I've got this thing about time, right? I don't think our time, I don't think 30 years is very long. If you think about how long it took for the, Museum of African American History and Culture to come onto the table, you know, 400 years before that happens. So what grows only 30 years or something like that. So it's about it's about in in the cultural war game. It's a time does time is very short for, in terms of one's personal life, but in, in hopefully in terms of the impact that can go on for a very long time. So I'm just enjoying the impact of the Black Arts Movement from the 1980s here in the UK and beyond because it feels like people are discovering that time as if that time is over and anybody like myself who was in it in some shape or form is dead. <laughs> so the art world is incredible ways of kind of doing these temporal kind of um, squeeze boxes that some things are very long down the way, but some things need to be squeezed and compressed and reevaluated very quickly and historicized so that everyone can jump on the kind of moment that's there. So there's that kind of, it's a gambit and it's a game and time is just one of those, one of those uh, things with it. But you know, the more you've, the more you can care. I'm very serious about the whole care, the whole, the whole care game. I really am because it's just, it's very old fashioned. But I think I'm very serious about about that place of um, making sure that we value some things which in at certain times have been seen as valueless. Shahido responses. You're oh, mu you're muted. <laughs> There's more similarities than Mark Mike recognized because our flat was sold to finish that building. <laughs> right. We live in this rented place now, which is fine. I mean, I don't have any problem with that. That's, that's part of life. But um, firstly, I'd like to uh, break it up in a sense because right from the very beginning, our, what we were doing was about social justice and photography was merely one of the ways in which we do it. Uh, I was never going to be a politician, a mainstream politician, but I wanted to stay politically active. And the way we did it was through three areas of intervention, media, education, and culture. So the three institutions I'm involved with, Rick, Bachala, and Chobimala, work in those, it's like three legs of the tripod, which make sure that the politicians cannot get away with their indiscretions. Uh, the building happens to in a sense, be the shell around that, protecting it, nurturing it. But there are practical things that also you can do. You can actually begin to inculcate a certain cultural practice within that space, which is yours. Uh, for instance, we have a creche in our building uh, and very, very few organizations do, but we felt this was part of it. Very early on, we began to in, uh, introduce a gender policy. Uh, a sexual harassment policy, a whole range of things, maternity benefits, paternity benefits, things which didn't go along so well with the business plan, but as far as we were concerned, added value to what we were doing. In terms of the individual institutions, Patshala, which you know, I, I began as a teacher with, then had Abir Abdullah, first year student, as its principal. So that there was... And today, out of our 26 teachers, 24 are former students. When I started, 
I would borrow people from all over the place and people like Mark and many other people were very generous with their time and they gave what they had to the students. But today it's the former students who, who take the rein. Uh, in Chobimala, it was Chobimala 10, just after I came out of jail, where, which was the last festival where I was director. Today, uh, in the Chobimala 11, it was a former student who was the director of the festival. And hopefully that transition is, is what will happen. And uh, there are some differences in the sense that uh, I remember Mark making a very conscious decision of not doing photography because he wanted to devote entirely his time to being to running the organization. In my case, I didn't think that was practical. A, I wanted to continue to be a practitioner and our practitioner, but also there was no one else who was going to take the risks I was prepared to take. So therefore, in a sense, my art practice also needed to be the spearhead where, which would also get hit the most and blunted the most. So it's, it's when birds move in formation, it's the bird in the front that actually has to do the maximum amount of work because the others move in the slipstream. And then that bird moves back and some other bird takes over and that bird then takes over the major load. And I think part of what we need to do is take that load in order to allow others to move into that place to create new slipstreams. That actually makes me think a lot about Susan Mizellis and her starting of the Magnum Foundation and now Kristen, you know, your role kind of shepherding it through to a different, you know, a new phase. Um, it's very exciting. I'm just, there's so many, I'm so glad that this conversation is being recorded um, because his, I, this is going to be one of the great ones um, and I'm honored to be here. So I want to also open it up to the audience. Um, and to see if we have some questions from the audience to give folks a chance. Um, there's Shannon. Hi, yeah, thank you so much. And just as a reminder for people, if you do have a question uh, for the panel, if you could put that into the Q&A box. Um, firstly, one for Shahid, Shahidul, um, the, the incredible, beautiful kind of graphic that you were showing earlier, um, Jade is wondering if that's available anywhere. Yeah, I, I was going to put it on the chat box. I can't find the chat box, so I'm going to mail it to you. That's great. We're sending follow-up emails to, to, to people with some resources, so that would be wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, another question for you. Um, have you dealt with any sort of cen censorship or government pressure on the artistic program since you have your own, own space? And if so, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about navigating that? Well, firstly, we've lost a lot of business. Uh, that doesn't has nothing to do with the institution. It simply has to do with my track record with the government. I'm too hot to take on. So being Shahidul friendly in Bangladesh is not a very wise thing for, uh, and I've had heads of multinationals ring me on a landline to say, sorry, Shahidul, nothing personal, but it's too risky for me to answer your phone call. Uh, that's, that's the life I lead. Uh, I don't carry a mobile phone anymore because I get tracked. I used to go around on a bicycle. That was how I worked. I, I cannot do that. I can never be on my own. These are some of the realities uh, that I face. And obviously that impinges not only on me, but on the people around me. Uh, you know, if, if I'm for, for a length of time, let's say someone doesn't know where I am for half an hour, suddenly people will start panicking, what's happened, what's going on, people will keep track. So that is that is very much part of the reality. But there is also another reality, and that is, I think today, the government have tried going against us, uh, tried to shut down our open air shows and various other things. It's backfired every time. Every time they've tried that, the people have come on board and we've been able to really get so much public support. And the fact that I'm out, has to do with the fact that people, many of you out there did a global campaign and people in Bangladesh took huge risks to campaign for my release. And that's what makes me out here now. Now, obviously the government had calculated that this would have shut me up. It certainly has not done that. And I think my role today is to ensure that that courage is contagious, that people can that what I do creates space for others to be able to do that. It's going to be tough. I think that was 
uh, a given. Uh, and yes, it's, it's been 32, 33 years and we're still fighting an uphill battle. Uh, I don't see that as a problem. I think if my life became too comfortable, I'd probably start worrying about what I was doing wrong. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, okay, maybe my question, just the orientation, we've got like nine minutes left. So maybe I, what I would love to hear from each of you is a sense of um, where do you draw your optimism? Like, is there something that you can leave us with to kind of, um, kind of gird ourselves for what's coming in the future, this balance of sustainability and adaptability? An opportunity for parting words, essentially. Um, and maybe whoever wants to go first, let's see, we'll take it. I, I'll take it because I, I took a little gift from something that Mark said that really resonated with me, um, which is the idea of generosity um, and having something to offer others and thinking of your work as being in service and thinking about organizations as being in service and, and also the work that you're able to see and share the generosity of artists who are sharing new ideas and their stories with us and the generosity that we're able to offer one another. And that's even relates back to the idea of a space, you know, having something, a space, um, and Magnum Foundation has our own tiny space, as you know, but it's in Manhattan and it's in a place where space is really valuable and where space is being, where artists are being pushed out and where it's hard to hold spaces for culture and spaces for people to come together, where space is very commodified and commercialized. Um, and it's hard to hold space where you can just be generous and do things without charging people for it. And so I think that's one of the places that I draw some hope and inspiration from is sort of pushing back against the need to commodify work or to meet the need to make this business be transactional or profitable and to just see what we have to offer um, each other and what we have to learn from each other and just hold open spaces where um, the kind of learning and exchange and um, generosity um, and as you say care um, can also happen. Love to you, Shahil. Well, um, we were we used to, Drick was built in, set up in what used to be my bedroom in my parents' house. Yeah, and that's where we were. It was parental property, so it wasn't a problem. Um, technically, it's a place which uh, it cannot be used for commercial purposes. But of course, where we live in Dhanmundi, everything is commercial. So it, it was a technicality. But of course, in my case, because of the special love affair that the Bangladesh government has for me, uh, they made it very difficult. And on a Thursday afternoon, uh, our weekend is Friday and Saturday. On a Thursday afternoon, we got this notice saying, you have to leave this building by Sunday morning because of this, this, and this regulation. We managed to save that one off, but we realized it was not going to be easy. So basically, we had to leave my parents' flat and move to a rented place. After I got arrested, um, and you know, one of the things that has happened is uh, before I got arrested, I was known in professional circles. I was known by people like you. I was not known by the average person in Bangladesh. Because of what happened, suddenly that visibility came up. So I, I suppose I, I need to thank my government for doing this. But I'm in the building. I'm coming out. I walk out of the main entrance. And there's a woman with a little baby, not a well-to-do woman by the look of her, little baby, newborn. She comes up to me. I could see that she'd been waiting for me. So she comes up to me and says, can you bless my child? I want him to grow up to be as brave as you. And when you feel that that is something that you mean to other people, and when you can see the spark in people's eyes, when, you, when I get stopped in the streets and people hug me and they have tears in their eyes and say, you said what we needed to say and no one else was going to say it. You know you've got a gift that he could never have got, gotten otherwise. Well, how do you follow that? I knew I, I, knew I should have went before you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was a mistake. <laughs> I can't follow that actually. I think um, 
you know, politics is, um, it's, 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 I think it's what 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 do we leave behind? And if you can leave behind something that other people can care for, I think that's really important. Stuff that has has some meaning. And I just my, my the message is all of it takes time. Um, we want social change, and we've all been waiting. I wrote an essay for Ryerson University called "The End of Waiting," um, and I read actually the the, the other day um, "The Fire Next Time" by James Baldwin. I just reread that, and. <laughs> there's an inspirational text um, so if I can do any if I if I left behind a percentage of the meaning that a text like that has then I'll be happy and if we've just and if it means that you know young black kids or older black people can can or or, or people can you know do, people can you know imagine that their their their, their freedoms are, are being cared for for what they make for what they say then I think we're, in, we're, we're, we're making progress. Um, optimism, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be really pra pragmatic on there. You know, th this work has been at times depressing. So, uh, you know, I, you know, I get, um, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna wake up in the morning and think every, every day that I'm a black man again today and somehow that's a curse. You know, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna pretend either that it's not it's not been a struggle and i'm sure kirsten and, and shahidal you, you'll say, say the same so we i don't want i don't i'm not i'm not saying i'm i'm on the dark side of things and but at the same time i want people to be aware of that it's not easy that, that's all i'm really saying and without people like john coltrane and uh stuart hall and um and james baldwin and other and ralph ellison and you know alice coltrane even and you know, great and um, you know, Tony Tony Morrison and books like Beloved, who remind us of just how haunted the kind of Western histories are. Then, um, then, then they're, they're, they're like they're, they're, they're like the um, that's the tonic that feeds us. We have to keep on telling the story. We have to keep on making the things that we need to make, and we have to stay in the making game because others will remake you as something that you're not if you're not careful. I think we can just drop the mic right there. Um, this has been such a pleasure, truly, truly a pleasure and an honor. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon. The programming continues. Thank you, Shahidul. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Marg. Thank you to the Magnum team. Um, what a wonderful event. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I mean, this was incredible and we are so honored and grateful that you were all here to talk today. Thank you, Shahidul. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Noel, for gathering this incredible panel. Yeah, we're very lucky to have you all. Thank you. I'm, I'm kind of speechless. Thank you. And uh, just to say, Mark, really, that, and I can't wait to listen to the, to the recording, that really articulated so beautifully some of the challenges um, of working uh, within institutions. And that was, that's what part of the, that's the reason we've put this program together, to invite, you know, um, people to share thinking and that was really incredible. So thank you so much. Thank you to you all. And uh, we'll be back here in half an hour with Agatha K um, in conversation with Anthony Luvera. Thank yeah. you so much, everyone. The rest of it goes well. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.